chapter 12 of Genesis, starting with verse 10. Genesis 12, 10 through 20. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarah, his wife, Indeed I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. And therefore it will happen when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me. But they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that, I may, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abraham came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful. The princess, or excuse me, the princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abraham well, 
for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this that you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her to be my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. And so Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him that they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Well, as you recall, God called Abraham to go on a journey with him, to join him uh, on this journey for life. And God brought Abraham and Sarah to the promised land and promised to give this childless couple children, many children. It took a lot of trust in the Lord to follow one step at a time, not knowing where they were going. And when they arrived, Abraham built an altar in each place where he settled down. He would call upon the Lord, which means Abraham worshipped God. His neighbors saw that Abraham worshipped his God. He didn't hide or try to hide his faith in his one God that is not made, uh, excuse me, in his one God. Abraham worshipped openly, a God that was not made with hands like their idols. He had altars, but he had no idols, just one God. Today we'll hear the story of Abraham crossing the line in two ways. Abraham left the promised land and he went down into Egypt. He crossed over the border or crossed the line when he crossed the border and left behind the promised land. Abraham also crossed a moral line. He went out of bounds when he failed to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The famine was severe in the land, the scripture says, so Abraham went down, and it always says down into Egypt, and we see that as a moral decline. We see that as an abandoning of God's promises and all that God said he would do. He went down into Egypt, to dwell temporarily. When they were close to the border, Abraham turned to his wife and he complimented her. He said, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. And she was remarkably beautiful, especially since she was age 65. Her name means princess, and Abraham truly had a prize in his wife, Sarah. But he also had a problem. If a powerful king wanted a beautiful woman in those days, he would make her a widow. And so it says in verse 12, therefore it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. And so fear, not faith, caused Abraham to fail to trust God to provide in the promised land. It was fear and worry that caused Abraham to conspire with Sarah to lie. He said, please say you are, you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, or because of what you say, and because I'm your brother, and that I may live because of you. So they conspired together, and they might have reasoned that because she was his half-sister, they had different mothers, same father, they would be telling the truth. But they crossed the line into deception. Telling half-truths means they were trying to cover up the other half. In this case, the other half was very important truth. Sarah was Abraham's wife. That part they were trying to hide. God's word tells us to trust in God with all of our heart and in all of our ways, in all that we do. So it's faith and it's 
in our actions. We're supposed to trust God. Don't lean on your own understanding or your own schemes to protect yourself to avoid pain like Abraham did. Tell the truth and trust the Lord, even trust him with the consequences. Walk in the light, not in the darkness. Let your good light shine that your neighbors may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, Abraham was winging it. He was thinking of himself and not about Sarah or about his testimony to his Egyptian neighbors. <coughs> Excuse me. And God was not at all in his thinking when Abraham went south of the border. Abraham made his own backup plan. In the event that God didn't protect him, he would do it his way. No food, I'll go down to Egypt. No protection from the Egyptians, I'll say I'm her brother. And they will treat me really well if, if, if I were not her brother. Or excuse me, if I were her brother and not her husband. I might even get rich. Who knows what he was thinking. But in verse 14 and following, it spells it out. So it was when Abraham came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abraham well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. So Abraham did get very rich. Now imagine that first night for Sarah in Pharaoh's palace. What was it like there with the rest of the women in the king's harem? How terrifying for Sarah. This was not their plan. What she had done, her lie, had brought her into a terrible mess. What had she done? How would she ever get out of there through those locked bars? What a mess they had gotten themselves into. So it was a terrifying experience for Sarah. Imagine that first night for Abraham. He failed to protect his wife. He knew it and she knew it. What was she suffering now where he could not be there to help or protect her? Now she's gone forever. He's still alive, but he wishes he were dead. It must have been a dreadful night of self-incrimination. How can I ever get my wife back? I should have trusted God to protect me. He does a better job of protecting Sarah. I can't now tell Pharaoh I lied and she really is my wife. I caused all this. How can I ever live with myself and my own selfishness? What was I thinking? I didn't see this coming. I've messed up my life. I'm so stupid. I'm a big, miserable failure. I wish I could go back and do it differently, but I can't. It's just too late now. Too late. Well, you know, no failure has to be permanent with God. Someone once wrote, it's God's job to undo our stupidity. <laughs> well, I like that, but it's not biblical. Because it's our job to obey God, not his job to undo our stupidity. Our job is to obey God and trust him completely, no matter what the consequences. We'll leave that with him. God stepped in and he rescued Abraham and Sarah with these great plagues. It seems that uh, God prefers to get his people out of Egypt with plagues and miracles. He will later, of course, take the nation of Israel in the time of Moses, the descendants of Abraham, out of Egypt uh, with more plagues, ten of them. And it'll be under the leadership of Moses at that time. So getting back to our story, yes, God steps in and he rescues Abraham 
from his failure. It says in verse 17, but the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Somehow Pharaoh or his men figured out the source of the plagues was his God because of Sarah. And they figured out the truth that it was not his sister, it was his wife. So Pharaoh blasted Abraham and he held him accountable for his shameful dishonesty and poor behavior. Verse 18, and Pharaoh called Abraham and said, what is this that you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. In other words, I might have made a terrible mistake. And so what could Abraham say when he's called before Pharaoh to give an account for what he thought he was hiding from everyone? Could he say, I lied because I was afraid and I wanted to see what I would get for myself? You know, see what you'd give me for such a beautiful woman if she were my sister? No. Abraham didn't say a word. He was silent. He hung his head down. His face was red with embarrassment. He was ashamed while Pharaoh gave orders to his men to deport these liars. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Armed men escorted Abraham, Sarah, and Lot, and all the rest, back to the border to make sure that they left the country. So they left Egypt in shame. They had blessed no one. They had failed the command to be a blessing because they failed to trust God to do what he promised to do, to protect them, to bless them, to keep them. Their Egyptian neighbors did not see their good works shine and did not glorify the God of Abraham. They were rescued by God from their impossible situation. And God brought them safely back across the border into the promised land for his purposes. The scripture says he went up when he returned. He had drifted down, but he quickly went up to the promised land. So God rescued him, brought him back for God's purposes. Not just because he had pity on Abraham and Sarah, but because God had a plan and, and Abraham's failure did not mean that God had to fail in his plan. God would still make for himself a great nation out of the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. And from them, God would reveal himself to all the nations. From them, God would send the savior of the whole world, Jesus Christ. But Abraham and Sarah still had to face the consequences of their failure. He rescued them from the circumstances, but did not rescue them from the consequences. They had crossed the line in their failure to trust God, and their moral lapse would cost them dearly. We would wrongly conclude that they outboxed the Egyptians and came out pretty well. After all, God did not let the Egyptians harm Sarah or Abraham. They did okay, right? Abraham got more wealth. Sarah was given her own Egyptian maid. Lot was given herds and flocks of his own. They repented and God forgave their sins. So what's the big problem? Everything that they brought from Egypt was a substitute for God's blessings. Everything from Egypt brought them suffering later. There was no lasting benefits, and there are no lasting benefits from disobedience to God. Brothers and sisters, walk by courageous faith, not cowardly fear. Trust God's wisdom, not your own. 
And when you make a mistake in Egypt, leave. Repent. Depart your sin. Forsake your sin and return to God and ask for forgiveness. We read in chapter 13 that Abraham returned to Bethel. He went back to the altar he first built there and he worshipped the Lord again. We don't read of him ever worshipping the Lord or seeking God's guidance in Egypt. Abraham is now back on track on his journey with God. His failures were confessed and forgiven. His lesson was learned. Abraham was again eager to listen to God and follow his leading. Next week, we will hear the story of a family conflict within Abraham's family and how Abraham's generosity with his nephew Lot came from his faith in God. Let us pray. Father, we tend to drift. We tend to move away from you. Call us back. Help us get back on track like you did Abraham and Sarah. Help us to be eager to receive your blessings and not accept any substitute, anything that's lesser, no matter how appealing or how attractive. Father, when you test us, we know that the Satan also tempts us. And so we ask that you strengthen us for such a time as that and for such a time as this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.